Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. And it's the first time we're meeting in the year. And I say happy, happy, happy new year for everyone in Jesus' name. And I pray that this year, the work of the Lord, the ministry, will prosper in every hand in Jesus' name. And wherever you are, a professional, a minister, a father, a mother, a leader, in any capacity, I pray that all that the Lord envisages and plans and ordains, you will do. You'll do it creditably well in Jesus' name. More grace, more strength, more wisdom, more power, more focus, and more vision from Him to us in Jesus' name. The Lord bless everyone. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you at this hour. Thank you for this time. We thank you because you have brought us together to do something in our lives, to impart our lives. And we are praying, Lord, that whatever we need to hear, everyone as individuals, I pray that that word will penetrate every heart in Jesus' name. And I pray that the world will edify everyone establish everyone and make us law to be the man the woman the minister the professional the leader we ought to be anywhere you have placed us in jesus name here at the alpha location and over there online everywhere where your people our leaders are gathered i pray lord that you impact everyone do good in every life that we may carry that goodness of the Lord unto people you are sending us to in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. I'm dealing with a topic that today that I would say is common to every one of us. And it is a topic, it's on our lips every time. We talk about the church, we talk about the body of Christ, and we need to kind of shake up ourselves and look at the scriptures and see what does the scriptures say about the body. That is the body of Christ. Is there any indication in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, that the body, that the Lord was thinking about the body? Is there any indication in Christ that he was thinking about the body? Any indication in the word of God that the ministers, the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers in the New Testament, that they were thinking of the body and so i'll be taking a series on the body of christ the body of christ as the foundation today i'm talking on loving and serving the body of christ loving and serving the body of christ if i don't know who the body of christ is if i don't understand the concept of the new testament and the concept of christ himself as to who is the body what is the body and how can i recognize the body the body of christ when i see that body i'll not be able to love that body you can't love an entity you don't recognize neither can you serve acceptably the body or the entity you don't recognize that's why as we begin our foundational study on the body of Christ we're talking on loving and serving the body of Christ I'm reading from Romans chapter 12 and I'm looking at verse 5 Romans chapter 12 reading from verse 5 it says so we being many are one body in Christ. That says a lot. It says we are many. We are not just one member. Neither are we just a thousand members. All over the world we have the body of Christ. And it says we are many. And so we are one body in Christ. 
and everyone members one of another what that means is that the hand cannot be isolated from the body and be of any use neither can the feet or even a toe cannot be isolated from the body and then be of any use of the head or the brain or every part of the body it says everyone members connected enriching aiding helping supporting functioning to be of help to the next part of the body in verse five in verse six it says even having then gives differing according to the grace that is given unto us it's telling us that abilities are different the hand different from the feet and the ear different from the eyes and uh, the nose and all the internal organs they're different one from the other and so if we're looking at our diversities we're looking at differences it's diversity in unity it is as all those different members different in the place they hold and different in the functions they have and different in the skills everything they're called to do in the body is that they unite together to be the one body of Christ that will be able to achieve what he wants us to achieve and he says what a prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of it verse 7 verse 7 says so ministry let us wage on our ministering that is let us focus on our ministering let us uh, kind of improve on our ministry let us so concentrate on the calling we have so that we're not copying the other one we're not uh, kind of imitating the other one we're not mimicking the other one everyone every minister will improve on what he has so that we'll be able to give our best first to the body and then to the world in which the body exists see the teacher on teaching and then in verse 8 in verse 8 it says so he that exhorteth on exhortation he that giveth let him do it with simplicity and he that ruleth with diligence and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness it tells us there in verse 9 and it says let love be without dissimulation let love be without pretense i need to tell you that love is not a feeling love is not a kind of fellow feeling towards the other yes maybe that is part of it but love comes from the will love comes from the mind it is not something okay if i feel good then i love if i feel bad then today is a pity i cannot love because i'm not feeling very good you see love within the body one part of the body to the other uh, have you seen that the hand as long as the hand is all right as long as the hand is not sick as long as there is no pain uh, that will hinder the hand from functioning uh, the hand loves the body unconditionally maybe the leg or muscle is uh, you know pulling you somewhere the hand is not going to say that's his problem he loves unconditionally does not ask why why is that so why is that so whatever we do any part of the body and then you bring it back now to the church whatever we do as members whatever we do as uh, as a group of members we love and it's without pretense it's without hypocrisy it's without hide and seek it's the love we have in the body it's not going to be like you know when we're together we see each other face to face then we talk well to each other and about each other but when we are apart then we see other things that are not of love it says let love be without dissimulation abhor churn reject and you say jettison and throw all from your life abhor that which is evil cleave to that which is good and then in verse 10 but says this be kindly affection that's love be kindly affection the feeling you have towards the other the hand of fellowship you stretch toward the other it says we should be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love not political love 
with brotherly in love with love that shows we're members one of the same body by the way that word brotherly shows that we're members of the family we're born again we're turned around our lives are changed and now we're put in the body and we understand whatever we do however we do that thing anytime anywhere we do that thing it says it should be of love that every time members of the body relate together is what brother love in honor preferring one another that just saying no competition so that the eyes are not seen and the best thing that happened in the body so that the ears are not seen and the most important effective indispensable in the body so that no part of the body will say i'm the very best it says the way we can synergize together unite together help together function together and be a very best is that we're not thinking of ourselves at the best higher indispensable in the body it says in honor we prefer one another he has something to give to the body i cannot give he has something to express in the body i cannot express and because of that we're always looking at and appreciating what the other person has that we may not have that talks about the body that is the body and that is how the body functions now we're going to break it down or break it up or a kind of separate them one from the other so that analysis will bring proper understanding one two three things i'm talking about number one the metaphors for the church the body of christ metaphor it is an illustration it's something from the known to the unknown and they will pick up this word and pick up uh, that entity and then we we'll say this is what the body looks like and as we consider all those things that the bible says about the body all those metaphors so yes i understand now that is the body and that is the church number two the ministers of the church the body of Christ. Now, the body, somebody has to minister to even the human body. A tailor has to minister to the body. That's why we have all the dresses we have. If the tailor does not do his part, then we are ashamed and we cannot go. And the people who are cooking, those who are feeding us, they have to do their part. They are ministers to the body. And the people that sing and make it, you know, life enjoyable, and then we have, you know, our nerves are cooled down and everything is pleasant they are minister to the body people that clean and do all this thing all those ministers in their various capacities they minister to the body the human body the same thing god has raised up ministers uh, some of them we know because uh, they are very uh, they are public uh, you know attention and others they do not have so much uh, of public attention but all those ministers are necessary the ministers of the church the body of christ number three is uh, you know the minister the me membership of the church the body of christ we're looking at number one number one the metaphors for the church the body of christ we're looking at seven things here we're looking at number one number one is the bride the bride you see even in israel god counted israel the nation of israel as his bride and god counted himself as the husband and then as you transfer from the old covenant to the new covenant from the old testament to the new testament this is the metaphor that is used so that we will understand the body of christ not only understand we respect the body of christ not only respect will serve appropriately will love appropriately the body of christ number one is the bride if you look at jeremiah chapter 3 reading from verse 14 it says turn O backsliding children says the lord for i am married unto you almighty god saying you've turned away you've turned your back to me turn 
turn around and look at me and look at my face for I am married unto you and I will take you one in a city of a city and it says two of a family and i will bring you to zion husband and wife they live together and i want you to live on mount zion and i want you to live to enjoy everything i have because I, the Almighty God, Jehovah Yahweh, he is, he said, I am your husband. Come to the New Testament now in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 2. In verse 2 it says, for I am jealous over you. Here is, the, here is Paul the Apostle. Here is the minister. And he has just one thing. To win the bride to Christ and to woo the bride to Christ and to wash the bride of Christ and then presage that bride of Christ look at it it says I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband that he, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ before we get to the ministers and the functions of the ministers here is one of the functions of the minister you look at the church you look at the body of christ as a chaste virgin a pure virgin and you want to do everything you can do to make that bride the church near come to the lord jesus christ and be acceptable to the lord jesus christ so then number one is the bride of christ how do you love the bride of christ how do you minister to the bride of christ what do you expect of the bride of christ the bride of christ should be so fair that god and Christ will appreciate this and the bride of my only begotten son. How do you feed the church? How do you care for the church? How do you pray for the church? How do you minister to the church? Are you ministering just, you know, to satisfy yourself? Or are you ministering to honor, to respect, and to build up the bride of Christ? Number two is the vineyard. The, the, the Lord looked at Israel, at the whole nation, and he said, you are the vineyard. He tells us in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1, he says, now will I sing to my well beloved is song of my beloved touching his vineyard my well beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill that's another metaphor another illustrative language that God himself uses for the children of Israel and then it says in verse 2 in verse 2 it says and he faced it Look at what God is doing. He said, that's precious to me. That's peculiar to me. That's my property. And because of that, I don't want any kind of wild beast, animal, to come into my vineyard. And he faced it, and he gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes it look, he looked at it it should bring forth grapes that's what the lord expects of the body of christ because the vineyard is simply a metaphor an illustration for the church and he wants it to bring forth grapes but then it said it brought forth wild grapes in verse 3 in verse 3 it says and now O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, notice this, evaluate this. Is this the right thing for the vineyard to produce? He says, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. In verse 4, he tells us, what could I, what could have been done more to my vineyard 
that I have not done in it. And when we look at the church, the body of Christ, who is illustrated by being a vineyard, what could God have done? He sent you as a minister. He sent me as a minister. Are we doing everything the Lord expects will do to the vineyard so that it will bear fruit, useful, profitable fruit? It says, wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth graves, uh, why uh, brought it forth wild grapes? Let's turn to the New Testament and look at John chapter 15. I'm reading uh, uh, verses 1 and 2. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, every branch in me. Every branch in me. He is saying that the church, that like branches on uh, a vine and he says all those uh, branches they are in me so that I can supply the grace I can supply the strength I can supply the sap I can supply the nutrients everything uh, those branches we need so that they'll bring forth fruit and he says every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away. Uh, what that means is uh, you look at the vine tree and you look at the various branches and they're just uh, taking sap and taking all the things in the vine, but they're not bearing fruit. And the, those who are bearing fruit, they're not having enough uh, sap, enough uh, things, so that because they're sharing with those who are not bearing fruit. And he says, the husband man himself, that is God, he'll take away those uh, fruitless uh, branches so that all the things available will be to, for those who are bearing fruit. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. Look at what the Lord is always wanting to do for the church because it's his church and it's his vineyard because of that as we're bearing fruit is cleansing us is purging us is uh, turning our minds so they think you should do this you should go that way you should evangelize and you should exercise yourself and be the proper branch and so you see every branch that beareth fruit he purges each Purchase it in our lives as ministers. He looks at us in our lives as uh, branches on the vine. He looks at our lives and there are some things that personally they are not bearing fruit. That talk is not bearing fruit. That character, that idiosyncrasy, that peculiarity is not bearing fruit. And everything in us and everything uh, that we have should bear fruit. And so he purges us that that thing. That that character, that characteristic, that idiosyncrasy, and that peculiarity that is not bringing the fruit he expects in the body, he takes those things away, not to hurt us, but to improve on us. And not to destroy us, but he see that we are precious in his sight. And anything that will hinder our bearing fruit, he takes that away. And then he tells us that it may bring forth more fruit. It may bring forth more fruit. Every verse of the Bible we read. Every preacher that comes to us, every friend that, he, that enlightens us, and everyone that corrects us, every song we hear, and every message we hear, every conference we attend, is what God is using to purge us that we may bring a more fruit. Look at number three here. Number three is the flock. The flock. The, the um, similitude and the language and the illustration for the church is that the church is a flock. Look at uh, Psalm uh, 80 verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock. Thou that leadest Joseph, that Joseph there is not just the Joseph of uh, as, a, as one person, it's the representative of the children of Israel at this time. You lead the nation like a flock. Thou that dwellest between the cherubims shine forth. How does it shine forth? It shines through us. Let your light therefore so shine that men will see your good works 
and glorify your father who is in heaven now the church is a flock how does the shepherd take care of the flock does he take care of some and leave the others does he have a pet sheep there that you know is always helping always lifting up always uh, providing for that pet sheep and then all the others are let know the shepherd takes care of the whole flock come to the new testament in acts chapter 20 i'm reading from verse 28 it's talking about the church and it's very clear here very pointed here it says take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the holy ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of god he calls the church flock and it says is all the flock we're to take care of and he says he has made us overseers he has made us shepherds he has made us leaders over the church of god to feed the church of god which he has purchased with his own blood which he has purchased with his own blood i want to remind you of israel as a nation they were in egypt and they were to be the sons of god my son singular the whole nation to be the son how did that happen he said slay the lamb apply the blood on the lintels of the houses and then it says when i see the blood i'll know you are redeemed i know that's another word for purchase i know you are purchased that's another word for save i've saved you by the blood of the lamb it comes to the new testament it says now it's not all the gentle nations all together that form the church they're the people who have been purchased and redeemed and saved by the blood of the lamb it says which he has purchased with his own blood that is the church all those people who are the ecclesia of god they have come out of the world they have believed on the lord jesus christ and by the blood of the lamb they are cleansed they are purchased they are redeemed they are saved and this is the church welcome to number four number four he says the church the body of christ is his building is is building it tells us in first corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 9 it tells us in verse 9 it says for we are laborers together with god we cannot labor on the body of christ in isolation without god if we don't know god if we are not his child if we are not a member of the body of christ we cannot come from outside we're not part of the body of christ and we do not know god he cannot walk with us we cannot walk with him and then we sneak into the church and come and build the church oh you see uh, how can that happen but that's what some people do they say that a man outside there is a good good a dramatist and you know he entertains people and if you put him on the billboard and you say this special sunday or this special month we're having entertainer so and so and everybody knows him and then we use his name to gather the people we're using him to build the church that will not happen he will not build the church and then he comes and he tells some lies on stage and he dramatizes and says some good good things and the people they shout they holler and they clap their hands they're excited but you understand when he's gone they go they cannot stay in the church because that outsider that sinner that smoker that uh, renegade and that uh, fellow he cannot build the church we are laborers together with god we were attached to god we're married to god we were born again by god he makes us members of the family of god and then he uses us because we are insiders it says ye are god's husbandry ye the church you are god's building we are god's building in ephesians chapter 2 i'm reading here from verse 20 ephesians chapter 2 reading from verse 20 and it says and have built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophet jesus christ himself being the chief 
cornerstone. In verse 21, it says, In whom all the building fitly framed together. You know what it's saying there? It's saying that the church is actually a building, and we're, we're fitly framed together, all the blocks one upon the other, all the blocks beside each other. There's a window here through which the air, fresh air, can come in. There is a door over there, another door over there, and uh, you know, people can come in and then go out to go and do their work and do their uh, services to the world during the week and then come back. It says, all the various blocks, all the various members are fitly framed together and groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. Verse 22, it says in verse 22, in whom ye also are build it together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Think about that. The church to be the habitation of God, the engineers and the construction workers and the people that construct the building and they know the person going to live here is not, you know, the poorest man in town. It's the highest, it's the greatest, it's the most powerful, it's the most high, it's the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's a savior it's a redeemer. How do you build a mansion for the king? How do you build a mansion uh, for the president? How do you build a mansion where the governor will stay and live? Have that concept of the church. That the church is a building. And we are the people God is using to construct and to build the church. We cannot build the church just anyhow. No training. No experience. We've never built anything. We've never done anything and now we are you know we say God is going to use us to build a building for him an habitation for him we should be people who are sensitive sensible intelligent spiritual and we have all the skill look at Bazalil that God was going to use to build a tabernacle the physical tabernacle look at the way God gave him the wisdom and God gave him the spirit and God gave him the skill and was able to build okay if uh, Bazaliel had the spirit and the skill and the and everything to build just the tabernacle in in the in the wilderness how much more the people of God today if we're building a habitation for the Lord for God through the spirit how we should be filled with the spirit obviously we should have been saved obviously we should be sanctified and holy and there's no argument if we're going to build a holy temple for the holy God of heaven, we ourselves are doing the building, we must be holy. If we're dirty, if we're unrighteous, if we're sinful, if we're self-centered, and if we have all the nature of Adam, falling Adam in us, how can we build continually, acceptably, the habitation of God through the Spirit? So, the church, the body of Christ, is likened to a building. And then next to that, number five, is a household. It's a household. And when you think of a household, you're thinking, of a family. Actually, the church is a family. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 31, and it says in verse 9, they shall come with weeping and with supplications, which I will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water, and in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble, uh, stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my Firstborn. And so he's telling us that he's the father over the family. It's the father over the household. And now we come to Galatians chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 10. Here is the church now, the church. And it says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good. Never do evil to the church, to the body of Christ. Because that body of Christ is the family of God and is the household. 
Behold, look at that. It says, especially unto them who have the household of faith. Not household of unbelief. Not household of warriors and fighters. It's not the household of, you know, push me, I push you. It's the household of faith. We believe in God. He believes in God. She believes in God. And we all believe in Christ. And that faith in Christ does something spectacular and transformational in our lives. And it says the church, the body of Christ is the household of of faith number six is a holy nation we're coming to you see we're coming to old testament new testament why so that you know what god expected of israel he expects now of the church israel failed but now the church cannot fail he has the father has sent his only begotten son so that he'll raise up a replacement in a way at this time period of he raise up a household he raise up a family he raise up also the people that will be referred to as a holy nation as a pure nation as a purified nation as a sanctified nation look at exodus chapter 9 19 i'm reading from verse 5 exodus chapter 19 let's start from verse 4 it says in verse 4 ye have seen seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself then in verse 5 in verse 5 it says how there now therefore if ye will obey my voice indeed well if the father and he has right to demand of all his children, obey my voice. He is the husband, and he has right of the bride to demand obedience from the bride. He is the building, the builder of the building, and he has right to say all those words he has used in the building and the materials used should be a kind of sub, a subservient or submissive or surrendered unto him. And because of this, it's building a holy nation the holy nation now is a symbol a metaphor for the church and it says now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me we're not supposed to compare the church of the world there's no comparison at all we're incompatible and it says will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the all people for the hearth is mine then in verse 6 it says in verse 6 and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and and holy nation that's a nation with that within a bigger nation the bigger nation is the nation where we live is the country where we live is the world in which we live and now the church is subset of the whole world it says now that church that body of Christ must be a holy nation. Let's come to the New Testament. It says in the New Testament, it says in First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 9, it's talking to the church now. It says, but ye a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a kingdom of uh, peace. And then it says, and holy nation. That's what the church ought to be. And that's what every local church in a denomination and the denomination part of the body of christ that's what everyone ought to be if the nation is to be a holy nation every individual a holy member and every family a holy family every community in that church is a holy community and every child every boy every girl is to have the experience of the lord that he has the holiness experience Experience, is born again and is sanctified and purified is because we're supposed to be a part of the holy nation but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you 
out of darkness, out of darkness, we cannot remain in darkness and be holy. Somebody says, I'm holy, but he's, he's, he's still in darkness. The character is of darkness, and the gang and the association he has is of darkness. You cannot be in the gang, you cannot be in the occult, you cannot be in a secret society, and you cannot be in darkness and say, I am saved and I'm part of the church. It doesn't work that way. He calls us out of darkness and he calls us into his marvelous light. And then now, number seven, the body of Christ. So we've been talking about the body, actually. The bride, that's the body. The media, that's the body. The flock, that's the body. The building, that's the body. The household, that's the body. And the holy nation, that's the body. Now it comes clear and it says, this is the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're reading from verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. As you summarize that point one, the metaphors for the body of Christ. Number one, the church is pure. As a bride, you have to be pure and everyone pure and the whole church pure and there is no local church in the body of Christ that is bringing in idolatry that is bringing in syncretism that is bringing in any secret idea or any demonic satanic thing because the body number one is pure number two the body is peculiar peculiar as the wife is peculiar to the husband and as the vineyard is peculiar to the vine dresser to the owner so the body of Christ is peculiar and then is productive that's why the bride uh, the divine is there so that the vine the vineyard can be productive and every church should be productive we're going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature so that the church will not remain so small and uh, cannot even be recognized that is there the church like all these metaphors of God they are uh, productive and they are also permanent when you have the wife to the husband until death do us part and actually you know God who is the husband and the Christ who is the bridegroom they do not die and because christ does not die and he is the bridegroom of the bride also the church does not die and the church will not die whatever is going on in any nation in any community the church is there upon this rock i build my church and the gates of hell and the gates of death shall not prevail upon the church in jesus name and the church is pleasant look at how the wife is to the husband and look at how all the flock is to the shepherd pleasant and our lives are supposed to be pleasant and pleasing that Enoch what with God and he pleased God by faith and our lives as the body of Christ individuals families communities and local churches were supposed to be pleasant unto the Lord protect him and because the Lord protects us he preserves us and whatever it is we need that will preserve and protect the Lord will do it and his purpose will work here on earth for a purpose if there were no purpose if the moment we got saved we should have gone to heaven but he left us there so that we can be preserved for a purpose the purpose of God himself for this reason have I called you and then he tells us that reason and that purpose and that's what the church ought to be we've seen uh, the metaphors now we're going to see the ministers at point number two point number two the ministers of the church the body of Christ the ministers of the church the body of Christ it tells us in first Corinthians chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 1 it says in verse 1 let a man so account of us as the ministers of 
Christ, with the ministers of Christ. In our church, uh, any local church, there may be a process of selection, a process of appointment, a process of saying, uh, okay, you be the minister there, you be the overseer there, but actually we are the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man should be found faithful. It is required in stewards that the Lord has chosen, that the Lord has selected, that the Lord has appointed, that the Lord has anointed to do the work for him. It is required in such as stewards of minister that a man be found faithful. And then we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? What's the purpose? What are we to do as ministers in the body? Look at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, For the perfecting of the saints. For the perfecting of the saints. That's his appointment. Now, if you don't believe that the saints, the membership can be perfected, you lose your ground. Because the reason he appointed apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers is for the perfecting of the saints. If you don't believe that you know, a particular dress can be clean, so clean and safe, it's coming from uh, the textile industry and it's coming fresh. If, if you don't believe that that can be done, you'll never make the attempt. You'll never find out how can I get this done. It's because you believe in the perfecting of the saints that's why you do everything you need to do that this is my calling for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry if you believe that you are the lone ranger the only one to accomplish the work of the lord you'll not raise up workers you'll not say i'm here for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ we're looking at who ministers are and what uh, the scriptures call those ministers, it tells us in uh, number one, the ministers of the world. When we say somebody is a minister in the body of Christ, in the flock, in the building, in the holy nation, in the household, when we say somebody is a minister in the body of Christ, minister number one is to be the minister of the world. Look at Luke chapter one, what you can at verse two. It says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world. It's talking of the apostles. It's talking of uh, those people that were eyewitnesses of the ministry of Christ. And it says they are ministers of the word. That's why it tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4 reading from verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. In verse 2 it says, preach the word. When ministers of the word preach the word, don't tell stories, stories, don't turn the church into a political arena. It says, here is your calling here is your appointment preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke and exhort without long suffering and doctrine verse 3 says it says for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine uh, the time will come especially these last days when people only what they want is bread and butter they want entertainment they want, uh, you know, gymnastics while you're preaching. That's all they're interested in. But it says, even at that time when people will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own laws, they shall heed to themselves 
teachers having itching ears in verse 4 it says they will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables then in verse 5 it says were ministers of the word watch thou in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of that ministry number one were ministers of the word number two we are ambassadors for Christ ambassadors for Christ it tells us in second chronics second Corinthians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 18 and all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation you see you, you see one and two number one he has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and there is uh, no disagreement between us and Christ and there is no barrier no wall of demarcation of sin between us and Christ we reconciled unto him and then after we're reconciled unto him he now has given us the ministry of reconciliation if there is a disagreement between you and Christ you cannot effectively be an ambassador of Christ if you are living proceed to what the Lord expects so you are not in reconciliation with the Lord you are not redeemed you are not reconciled you are not justified you are not saved you are not living a life that glorifies Christ that Christ will say that is what I saved you for if you are living in opposite to the declaration of Christ and you're no more light and you've lost the savor of the soul there's no way you can be an ambassador of Christ because you has reconciled us unto himself and after that he has given us the ministry of reconciliation in verse 19 verse 19 that says to we that is to say that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, in verse 20, it says, Now then we are, but now then, after we are saved, after we are reconciled to Christ, after we are redeemed, after our lives have been transformed by the power of the grace of God, it says, Now then we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ said that is what Christ should have done what Christ should have said how Christ should have preached and the idea and the knowledge and the wisdom and the grace Christ should have made available we now are walking on his behalf he says we pray you in Christ said be ye reconciled unto God. It tells us we are messengers of the Lord. That's number three now. Number three messengers of the Lord. In Malachi chapter 2, reading from verse 7. Malachi chapter 2, we're reading from verse 7. Messengers of the Lord. It tells us here, it says, for the priest's leaves should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the lord of hosts the king has sent you on an errand he tells you where to go he said you he told you who to meet and he told you what exactly to tell him and you go to him you don't edit what the king has sent you to go and deliver you don't modify what the king has sent you to deliver and you don't turn upside down and you don't uh, corrupt what the king has sent you to go and deliver we're messengers of the lord of hosts and everything he has given us the way he has given us and the, the strength and the intensity of what he has given us to deliver Deliver, that is what we deliver. Number four, we are watchmen for the Lord. Watchmen for the Lord. In Ezekiel chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. I want you to understand that that word.
I, that pronoun I, that's the Lord himself. And that I is greater than all the angels in heaven. Myriads of them, billions of them. And that I, one single I, is greater than all the church committees in every church and in all the churches put together. It says I, not, uh, you know, some committee somewhere and not some people somewhere. The greatest, the highest, and the most high. He has given us this commission. He says, son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth. If we never pray, if we never wait on the Lord, if we never see the Lord, if we never hear directly from him, if we don't have inspiration from God, if we don't have illumination, enlightenment from God, if we do not have the word that we know from our heart of hearts, here is God speaking to me. And the letter killeth. If it's only the letter we, you know, dish out, we have not been sent by him. He says, well, hear the word at his mouth and give them warning from me. Verse 18 says, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning. Why would Ezekiel, why would I, why would you, after we know that the Lord has put the word in our mouth and he sends us to the people and he says, give the word to them from me. Why will we not give them the warning, give them the word? Very simple, because of fear because of self-centeredness i'm thinking what will happen to me if i give them the word of god they don't like to hear that but god said whether they will hear or forbear here is the word i've given you and you are a messenger of the Lord as well as a watchman for the Lord and so he says when I say to the wicked thou shalt surely die and thou givest him not warning nor speakest to one the wicked from his wicked way to save his life to save his life the only way we can be agents of salvation is that we give the warning to the wicked we give the warning to the sinner we give the warning to the people who are living in rebellion against God and we give the warning to the people who are deliberately disobedient, deliberately disobedient to the word of the Lord and because they're committing this particular sin they don't want you to ever mention that sin because they're going this wrong way, they never want you to mention that it's the way of destruction and the way of perdition for the people who live in this way they don't want that and that's why they will you know do this and do that so that they can shut up your mouth and you don't tell them and they want to create fear in you but he sends you out as the watchman and he says you'll get the word from me and want them to save his life the same wicked man if he does not repent shall die in his iniquity but is blood will I require at thine hand. In verse 19, verse 19 says, Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Then in verse 20, in verse 20 he tells us, again when a righteous man does turn he backslides from his righteousness and he commits iniquity and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him the righteous man, the righteous lady, and the righteous member, because she never spoke a word of warning to him, and say, you're saved, you're forever saved, you're saved, and everything is alright, and the fellow accepts that, and he says, I'm saved, I'm saved, and then he goes to evil, he said, it will die in his backsliding, because you have not warned him, and his righteous which he has done shall not be remembered but 
his blood will I require at your hand he wants us to give warning look at verse 21 in verse 21 he says nevertheless if thou one the righteous man that the righteous sin not and he does not sin he shall surely live because he is want also thou hast delivered thy soul well watch men we need to be watchful watchful over our lives and watchful over our congregation watchful over the members watchful over the converts that are coming into the kingdom of god in acts of the apostles chapter 20 i'm reading from verse 28 acts chapter 20 we're looking at verse 28 take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the holy ghost has made you overseers has made you watchmen to feed the church of god which he has purchased has bought as redeemed, as saved with his own blood. In verse 29, verse 29 says, For I know this, that after my departing, my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. In verse 30, it says, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. They say they are working for Christ, actually they are winning disciples after them. And their pictures and their stature and their, uh, and their position looms higher than that of Christ. And the people fear them and they are the point of reference to all those disciples. And Christ is not the point of reference. It says there will be people, that's why we watch, that's why we are vigilant over the flock of the Lord, over the people of God. So that the people the wolves don't come in the unclean people don't come in the backsliders don't come in and the people who are wanting to make a local church or some disciples they are wanting to make them to contribute to their ego and to their self and to their self-image that's why it says a watchman and you watch over the flock because there'll be people that will come and draw away disciples after them in verse 31 it says therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years i cease not one every one night and day with tears and now we come to uh, another thing that what you do as ministers is the teachers of all the counsel of god we called as ministers of the world the messenger of the lord and we're also called as watchmen and we're called as the ambassadors of christ and now number five we're called as teachers of the whole counsel of god in acts of the apostles chapter 20 we're looking at verse 26 it says therefore i take you to record this day that i am pure from the blood of all men in verse 27 it says for i have not shunned i have i have not been negligent and i have not avoided my real responsibility to declare unto you all the counsel of god that's what the teacher of the word does that's what the preacher of the word does does that he declares the whole counsel of God. We're looking at number six, we're sowers, we're planters, we're builders for God. We sow the seed of the world and then we plant the churches and we nurture, we nourish, we establish and we build up. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 6, it says, I have planted Apollo's water, but God gave the increase. We plant, we must plant. We cannot just fold our hands and say, well, the seed is there, but the Savior is there, and the Savior has all power, so it will connect the seed with the hearts of the people. No, he sends us out. That's why he gave us the great commission, go ye 
into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And he says, this watch of repentance shall be preached in all nations until he comes. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gave that giveth the increase. Verse 8. Verse 8 says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. They are building the same habitation for God. And they are shepherding the same flock, the body of Christ. So there's no difference. It says we're one. We're united. We're agreeable. And we're agreed with each other. We're not opposing each other. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9. Verse 9 says, for we are laborers together with God. We're laborers together. We're praying to him. We're walking together we're trusting him we're walking together we're depending upon his grace we're walking together and we understand without him we cannot do anything good because of that we're laborers together with God and ye are God's husbandry ye are God's building then in verse 10 in verse 10 according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon but let every man take heed Take heed how he buildeth thereupon in verse 11. For the foundation can no man lay, and that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then we are preparing the bride for heaven preparing the bride for heaven. That should be on the top of our minds. That we're not just uh, going here, going there, running there, hopping there, and uh, circling the globe uh, just to preach and to fulfill all righteousness. There is a goal. There is a purpose. He has called us that our influence, our preaching, our intercession, our counseling, everything we do will be to prepare individuals and the whole church for the coming mean of the Lord. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 2, it says, for I am jealous over, over the church with godly jealousy. Uh, have you, uh, you understand that word jealousy? That's the way you use uh, jealousy. You're jealous of somebody because he has something you don't have. That is bad. That is evil. He's uh, riding that car. I uh, want to see how, what has he done more than I have done that is riding that car. And every time you look at him from the corner of your eyes, you're jealous. And or he has a particular position, privilege you don't have. You're jealous that one is bad but he's talking about the husband and the wife how the husband jealously watches over his wife and he says this is godly jealousy you don't want anything to touch your wife anything to defile your wife anything to make the heart of your wife stray away from you that's what Paul the apostle is saying he's saying I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for i have espoused you to one husband that i may present you as the chaste virgin to christ in colossians chapter 1 reading from verse 28 colossians chapter 1 we're reading from verse 28 it says whom we preach warning every man every man in our local church every man in our ministry every man in the body of christ is saved warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every one every man perfect in Christ Jesus if that is the work that is the ministry that is the assignment that is the duty of the ministers what do the members look like? We've seen the metaphors for the body of Christ. We've seen the ministers of the body of Christ. Now we're looking at members, the membership of the church, the body of Christ. The membership of the church, the body of Christ. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 12. For as the body is one, 
and has many members, or, and all the members are not of that one body, being many are one body, so is Christ. And then in verse 13, in verse 13 it says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, immersed into one body, subdued, submerged into one body, made part of one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, whether we be slaves or masters, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. We're looking at uh, the membership now, what the membership are, and who the members are. We're looking at number one, sons and daughters of God. Sons and daughters of God. How do we become members of the body? Members of the church. I mean, uh, the invisible church. How do we become members of the militant church? So that eventually we'll become members of the triumphant church. Invisible church, ecclesia. Those who are called uh, out of the world. They are called out of darkness. They are called out of sin. Uh, they are called out of evil. And they are called to become uh, members of Christ. Son number one, sons and daughters of God. In Second Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 16 and what agreement has the temple of god with idols for ye are the temple of the living god as god has said i will dwell in them and walk in them i will be their god and they shall be my people in verse 17 it says wherefore come out until we come out of sin, we are not members of the church, his church. Until we come out of darkness, we are not members of his church. We might be members of the visible church, but we are not members of the invisible church. We are not members of the militant church. And we are not members of the triumphant church. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord and touch not the unclean thing. There are people that think the unclean thing is a cigarette, the unclean thing is alcohol. That's right, that's right. The unclean thing, the idol. Any idol, it defiles us. Anything, anyone, we use to replace God and we we'll worship that one, bend to that one, obey that one, instead of obeying Christ and Christ alone. The Pharisees could have been an idol to the disciples, to the apostles. And those Sadducees could have been an idol, fearing their idol and bending to their idol and submitting to their idol. Idol, fearing the powers that be in their land. Those things could have been idols for them, and that would have made them unclean before God. And God says, Be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Verse 18, and I will be and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Those are members of the church, the body of Christ. Number two, members of Christ. Members of Christ. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading there from verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. Now ye uh, know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. That is when you are born again, you come to the Lord, you become members of Christ. He says, shall I then take the members of Christ and make Make them members of an harlot. God forbid. Look at verse 16. In verse 16 it says, What know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? He that is joined to a sin partner is one body. You cannot say, you know, I, I just did that, but I'm a child of God. And I know that fellow is a sinner. That fellow is a harlot. That fellow is a, you know, a dirty, defiled person. But you know, at the time of temptation, I just I said, no, you become one with the harlot. You become, you have the same identity and the harlot is outside the kingdom and when you join yourself to her or to him, 
then you become like him like her and you are outside the body it says for two saith he shall be one flesh in verse 17 in verse 17 but he that is joined unto the lord he that is married unto the lord he that is reconciled unto the lord he that is so glued to the lord joined to the lord is one spirit and then in verse 18 it says flee fornication every sin that a man doeth is without outside the body but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. Verse 19. Verse 19 says, Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Then in verse 20, it says, For ye are bought, purchased, and saved, and redeemed with a, with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Number three, we're children of God. Children of God is the father and we are the children. Is the, is the re redeemer and we are the redeemed. And he says that if we have joined together with the Lord like that, we are now children of God. In First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 14, as obedient children, those are members of the church. The members of the world, they have their own characteristic. The members of the world, they are disobedient, that's their characteristic. They are sinful, that's their characteristic. They are rebellious, that's their character. They are defiant, that's their characteristic. But when we become saved and we're members, not just members of the visible church that the ushers can count, one, two, three, twenty, thirty, three hundred, not that, but members of the invisible church of the body, of Christ as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance in verse 15 verse 15 says but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation verse 16 says because 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 it is written be ye holy for I am holy Holy. And not only that we are sons and daughters of God, not only that we are members of Christ, not only that we are children of God, we are saints in Christ. We are saints in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 1. In verse 1 it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children as precious children as peculiar children and as purified purged children be ye therefore followers of god as dear children then in verse 2 in verse 2 it says walk in love not lost don't walk in lust walk in love not flesh walk in love walk in the love of god walk in the love of christ christ has shown us what love actually should be he didn't have a kind of emotional feeling or a fleshly feeling towards any of those people like mary like martha like any of them he said walk in love it says as christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. In verse 3 it says, But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Those are members of his church as becometh saints who are saints in Christ. Romans chapter 1 reading from verse 7. In Romans chapter 1 reading from verse 7 it says to all that be in Rome beloved of God called to be saints. 
called to be saved. That's the calling of members of his church. And he tells us, uh, number five now, vessels unto honor. Vessels unto honor. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 19, he says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having day sealed. The Lord knoweth them that are his. The Lord knoweth them. We're talking about members of the church. And these are members of the church. They are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. They are saved and redeemed and purchased by the blood of the Lamb. And they are established by the word of the Lord himself. And he says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone, everyone, every member of the living church, every member of the body of Christ, every member of the invisible church, every member of the militant church, and progressing to become part of the triumphant church. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Look at verse 20. It says in verse 20, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. The vessels of honor, they will go to heaven when they die. The vessels to dishonor, who dishonor Christ and dishonor his doctrine and dishonor his calling and dishonor the body of Christ and dishonor their own body too and their own lives, they will go to hell if they die in that condition. Then in verse 21, verse 21 says, if a man, it says, if a member but therefore purge himself, herself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meat suitable and feed for the master's use. You notice something there? If we're not saved, we're not feed, we're not meat, we're not suitable for the master's use. If we're backsliding, if we're living in secret sin, we're not feed, we're not meat, we're not suitable for the master's use. If we're unrighteous, if we're unholy, if we're unsanctified, we're not meat, we're not feed, we're not usable, in the hand of the Lord. It says the vessels unto honor, sanctified and made for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Look at verse 22. In verse 22 it says, flee also youthful laws, flee also fleshly laws, and flee also all those fleshly night activities. It says, but follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. It tells us we are light shining for Christ. Light shining for Christ. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 15, that she may be blameless and harmless sons of God. And you know the intention of the Lord for us, the purpose of the Lord for us, the calling of the Lord for us, is not that we'll be kind of accumulating blame guilt, shame, defilement. It says we should let those things go because now the calling he has given us, he wants us to be blameless and harmless sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We shine as lights in the world. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 14. And he says, Ye are the light of the world. And he says, A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. In verse 15, it says, Neither do men light a candle and put it on a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, let your light so shine. Let your light so shine. That language shows that you may have the light and because in your environment you are doing something that you don't want. Uh -uh. Are you a Christian? 
Are you a believer? Are you a child of God? Are you one of these people that were here of? Holy people serving a holy God through the holy covenant of the Lord. But look at what you are doing. So you hide that light. I don't want them to know my identity. I don't want them to know that this is who I am. It says, let it out, the light. If you are born again, let it shine. If you are a believer, let it shine. Don't hide your identity. It says if you belong to God, act as the children of God shall act. And let your light shine. Not only shine, let it so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And now we are partakers of God. Christ. You're a member of the body of Christ, so you are a partaker of the grace of Christ, the virtue of Christ, the light of Christ, the life of Christ, and the character and the nature of Christ. He says we we'll become partakers of Christ. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3 there. It says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. Then in verse 4, in verse 4 it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers. That's the word, partakers. You see the nature of Christ, and you pray, and you consecrate, and you dedicate yourself, and you show your desire. You really want to be a real Christian. You want to be a real member of the visible church, and of the militant, triumphant church, and you come with that passion, you come with that petition, and you come, you really pray that he will make you a partaker of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. I pray I'll do it for everyone in Jesus name and the preachers will not only preach they'll partake of the very nature and the virtue and the life of Christ and that will show the light will show the calling of the Lord that this is who we are we're always looking at Christ and we're always wanting to have all his virtues, all his character everything that he has in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in verse 18 but we all those of us who have come to know Christ and we all, those of us who are partakers of his nature and of his grace and we all those of us who aspire to get to heaven and those of us who want to be useful in the kingdom of God now before we get over there and we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed and transformed and renewed and recreated into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. All we've heard this morning, all the declaration, all the promise, and all the availability of Christ to do it in us, I pray He'll do it in every one of us in Jesus' name. Those who are here, those who are online, everyone, everywhere that will come nearer to Christ and then will show that by His grace, greater grace in our lives and greater glory in our lives will become more and more and more and more like Christ. Christ in Jesus name is that possible I said is that possible can that be done whatsever we desire when we pray believe that you have received and you have in Jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the Lord and pray from the depth of our heart and say Lord this is what you have ordained and this is what we're going to have the Lord will do it in every life now stand up and open your mouth both here and at every location where we are from the depth of your heart cry to the Lord and say Lord here is what I ought to be and here is what I will be in Jesus name.